Now we're going to talk to author Andy Worthington about his book, The Guantanamo Files, the stories of the 774 detainees in America's illegal prison. Andy, welcome to the Young Turks. Hi there. Hey there. Uh, first, why is Guantanamo illegal? Why is it an illegal prison in your mind? Well, I mean, it was established, um, uh, you know, on Cuba because it was presumed to be beyond the reach of the, of the U.S. courts. That was the um, exact intention. Um, and so as a result, for two and a half years, actually, until the Supreme Court intervened, it was a, a prison that was completely beyond the law. Uh um, at that point, the Supreme Court intervened and gave the prisoners habeas corpus rights, in other words, the right to ask why they were being held. Um, it then took another four years and some intervention in response by Congress um, for that to be reinforced. Um, but even to this day, the prisoners who are being held there are not being held as prisoners of war according to the Geneva Conventions. They're not being held as criminal suspects. They're being held as this novel category uh, of human being, um, you know, which has never existed before. Well, Andy, it seems to me that you don't understand that they are dangerous terrorists, uh, all proven as such, right? Well, no, I mean, you know, even if they were, um, then I would say that they should be prosecuted in federal courts as criminals. But the problem, of course, is that there has never been any adequate process for determining um, whether having people like George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld say that these people are the most dangerous terrorists in the world actually means that there is any proof that this is the case. And objectively, the only time that we have um, seen these cases examined um, by judges in U.S. Federal, in U.S. courts, in the district courts, has been since the Supreme Court gave constitutionally guaranteed habeas rights to the prisoners back in June 2008. And in the last 19 months, we've had 47 rulings by the judges, and in 34 of those cases, so that's nearly three quarters, um, they have judged that the government has failed to establish that the, the men in question um, had any connection to al-Qaeda or the Taliban. You know, I think uh, the Republicans in this country would say, and, and I think a lot of their supporters would say, Andy, well, look, those guys are, they were caught in the battlefield. We don't have a lot of information on them, but they're obviously dangerous. We caught them in the battlefield in Afghanistan, and if we put them back out there, they're going to fight us. Uh, and what do you want us to do, release these dangerous guys? Well, I, I don't want anybody dangerous to be released. Um, but, you know, intelligence reports that have emerged over the years have suggested that no more than two to three dozen of the people held there are genuinely dangerous. And after the task force established by President Obama reviewed the cases last year, they suggested that 35 prisoners should face trials. Now, you know, they also said that another 47 should be held indefinitely because they regarded them as too dangerous to release, but that they don't have any usable evidence. To me, that suggests that they have evidence that is tainted by the use of torture. Um, but, you know, this figure of three dozen is the one that we should be looking at. The rest of them, what we know and what the supporters of Guantanamo are persistently ignoring is that the majority of the prisoners were not seized by Americans on the battlefield. They were bought for bounty payments uh, off the uh, U.S. military's Afghan and Pakistani allies for an average of $5,000 a head. Now, that translates to somewhere between $125,000 and a quarter of a million dollars um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So you can see that on that basis, handing over stray Arabs uh, was a pretty lucrative thing to do. So what did we learn from the case of the Uyghurs that were in, or the Uyghurs, as they say, in, uh, in Guantanamo? Uh, I know a lot of people say that... Uh, that they were there uh, wrongly. Uh, do we have any evidence to suggest that? Yeah, I mean, I think the only evidence that um, people who continue to maintain that they were some kind of threat is that these guys had fled Chinese persecution. Now, some of them were trying to make their way to Turkey or to Europe. They found that very difficult. Others had some really pretty impractical plan to rise up against the Chinese government. And they'd ended up in this rundown settlement in the Afghan mountains where, according to all the accounts, 
they kind of hung around there, were trying to renovate these broken down buildings. They had one gun between them. Um, that's the extent of their military training. They had no intention ever of taking on anyone other than the Chinese government. Um, so, you know, at which point do they ever constitute an enemy of the United States? And, you know, these guys had their place bombed. They fled to Pakistan. The villagers there welcomed them, then um, tricked them, sold them to U.S. forces. And they end up in Guantanamo for all these years. So, you know, who are these guys? They're nobodies. There was, there was never any reason for them to be held. See, Andy, you're going to run into a political problem, of course, and we're talking to Andy Worthington. He's the uh, author of the Guantanamo Files, uh, because, you know, conservatives in wherever they're going to be released, Virginia, New Jersey, doesn't really matter, are going to say, hey, wait a minute, these guys, one, they were in Guantanamo, so you tell me that they might be innocent, but I don't really know. Two, well, look, I'll call that that they were terrorists against the Chinese government, they're terrorists either way. And three, you just admitted one of them had a gun. So that's it. Uh, we can't have them in Virginia. Uh, how do you overcome that? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's been very difficult. I thought that the plan to bring some of these guys to the U.S. mainland last April was a great idea. But when the Republicans got wind of it, then they, they caused a big stink and Obama backed down. It's made it very difficult for other countries around the world to take cleared prisoners who can't be returned to their home countries. You know, because obviously the first thing that they want to do is to turn around and say to Ambassador Daniel Freed, why should we take guys when you won't take any yourselves? You know, I've, I've met released prisoners in this country. I've spoken to other released prisoners. Um, the fact is that when so many people were wrongly detained and never posed a threat in the first place, then the best way to understand that is for people to be able to meet them. And very honestly, people in the UK have been able to do that for many years now. There, there are several ex-prisoners who have travelled around the country, who speak regularly. People have been able to see and understand this. The one country on earth where the people are not able to grasp this is the United States. And had these Uyghurs been brought to the United States last spring, um, all of this paranoia and, and fear-mongering would have been exposed for what it is when people would have been able to meet these guys and, and to realize, hey, they're not terrorists at all. Terrible mistakes were made at Guantanamo. <laughs> you know, there was this great little irony. Uh, the O'Reilly program, uh, I think Beck was on it too, they were making fun of these Uyghurs because they eventually got released to some island somewhere and they were swimming because they're on an island. And they showed the pictures. They're like, look at these. Now, under Obama, terrorists going swimming and opening up an ice cream shop. That's what their plans are. Then I thought, perhaps if they're opening up an ice cream shop, they weren't really terrorists. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the two different ways of looking at things, aren't they? When you, the people, the kind of commentators that you're talking about will twist everything around to their interpretation. I mean, these guys were released in Bermuda last June. Um, the last I heard, they're all working um, on a golf course there. There are no problems. Um, why should there be any problems? These guys were swimming, laughing, enjoying their freedom um, because they just lost seven years of their life for no reason. Are, are they bitter about it? Well, certainly they didn't seem to be. Certainly there's nothing that I've heard um, through their lawyers and, and through their translator and through, through other people that I know. Uh, the same is, is the case with the majority of the people who were wrongly detained. They actually just want to get on with their lives after, after losing so many years away from their loved ones. You know, if I was them, I would be enormously bitter over it. I don't know why they're not more bitter. Um, well, you know, that, well, that's the thing. I mean, the Pentagon regularly comes up with these grossly inflated figures of the numbers of people who have returned to terrorism or the battlefield, or however they put it. It has been established that this includes people who dare to write a book or appear in a film or write an op-ed in the New York Times calling for the habeas corpus for prisoners. It doesn't actually mean people who have um, physically become involved in any kind of violence against the United States. Now, um, there is certainly a small number of people who have, and whether these people were genuinely dangerous in the first place or were embittered by their experience, I don't know. But, you know, the majority of people who were released, they got through this horrible ordeal um, through their faith and through the, the kind of comradeship amongst the prisoners there. 
And, you know, I'm impressed by that. Um, you know, as you say, when, when we tend to think about it, it's like, how would you come out of this experience not so extremely bitter that, you know, if you weren't a terrorist in the first place, you would be afterwards. But that's really not um, my experience and my knowledge of the majority of the men who've been released. We're talking to Andy Worthington. Uh, he's author of The Guantanamo Files, the stories of 774 detainees in America's illegal prison. Andy, before we let you go, I've got to ask you about what I think is uh, one of the devastating parts of this. Not just that those, a lot of the people that are there are innocent. In fact, most of the people there that were there are, were innocent. Uh, but that we already knew that, and we kept them for years afterwards. Uh, tell me about how you think Bush did that, if he did, and, and then Obama as well. Well, you know, I mean, Colonel, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who was the chief of staff um, for Colin Powell, has spoken out over the last year on, on several occasions. And just last week he submitted a declaration in a court case by a Sudanese hospital administrator who was picked up wrongly in Pakistan, who's, who's um, filed a suit for compensation against the U.S. government. And, you know, he said, this went right to the top. Bush knew, certainly Cheney and Rumsfeld knew, and to a certain extent they didn't care. Cheney didn't really care how many people were wrongly detained if this process of um, interrogating them was going to yield more information about, about the threat that they faced. So, you know, he didn't care whether 99 out of 100 people were wrongly detained. It's difficult to know how prevalent that idea was and how much they fooled themselves that actually they did have the right people. And I think the really tragic thing is that having bought people, having not screened them properly to find out whether they had the right people, they actually thought, we've got a load of al-Qaeda guys here who are trained to resist interrogation. The only way that we're going to get them to talk is that we have to get heavy with them. You know, so no Geneva Conventions. And where did that lead? Well, sadly, terribly, that led to the introduction of a torture program. All right. Well, finally, how about Obama? I mean, uh, Greg Craig was his White House counsel and was telling him, hey, look, we know some of these guys are innocent. We've got to let them go. And how did Obama respond to that? Well, you know, he, he, he won uh, in terms of what I think was actually a cowardly response. And he didn't follow um, the principles that Greg Craig had tried to establish to say, look, we can't, we can't negotiate on this. It's, this is important for us to roll back uh, the crimes and the mistakes of the Bush years. So, you know, I don't know. Now the administration seems to be floundering. It's on the back burner. There are other things that are more important. Um, and I think the initiative has, has been lost. And I don't really see um, how the place is going to close quickly. But I think the need for it to close is just as urgent as it was when Obama came in, you know, back in January last year with these bold promises. You know, the other part of it is, look, if I'm the president, uh, I, and I know these guys are innocent. You know, even if you minus the 47 that they're not really sure about, right? Well, I don't care what the politics are. I'm not going to keep innocent people in prison for another day, let alone a week, let alone a month, let alone a year. And I guess Obama is saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to play politics, and the politics does not allow me to do that, so I'm, I won't release them. I mean, isn't that a fair assessment? Well, kind of it is. I mean, a hundred of the guys that are still there are ones who have been cleared for release by his task force. And, you know, in ones and twos and threes, they're going to European countries and other countries like Bermuda, like, uh, you know, ten European countries so far that are prepared to do what the Americans won't. But this is a very long and slow process, and it's a disappointment to me that it's so difficult to achieve any momentum in the United States um, beyond certain groups of you know, activists like in Amherst, Massachusetts, who said to the Senate, uh, we don't like your ban on bringing cleared prisoners. We'd like to actually adopt a couple of guys and bring them here. It's, it's, it's disappointing to me that there isn't more movement in America to say, why are we not taking some of these guys? They're not terrorists. Do you think that Belgium and France and Hungary and Ireland and Spain and Switzerland and Slovakia and Georgia and Bermuda and Palau would be taking these guys? giving them new homes if they were genuinely dangerous. Of course they wouldn't. I think there's an easy answer to it. You take them all, you put them in John Boehner's district, and you move on. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, Obama has not done that. Okay, and I don't want anybody to get me wrong. The, part of the reason he hasn't been able to do that is because the Republicans won't let him. 
Now, like I said, if I was president, I wouldn't give a damn what they said. I'd just do it, right? But we, that's not the president we have. <laughs> as as yeah, Rumsfeld I mean, I think... famously said, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the president uh, you wish you had, but it's the president you have that you go to war with. <laughs> yeah, well, no, exactly. And I think, that, I think that Obama showed such promise, you know, on the campaign trail and when he came into power, that that makes it extra disappointing to find pure pragmatism going on. But, I mean, I do actually think that, that the terrible things that happened during the Bush years need more than pragmatism. They actually do need uh, some real assertion of principles. Um, it, would be, it would be good for America. It would be good for the rest of the world. Um, so I'm bitterly disappointed that that hasn't happened. All right. The book is The Guantanamo Files, the stories of 774 detainees in America's illegal prisons. If you want to know uh, about what happened there, the real truth, uh, read the book. Andy Worthington, thank you so much for joining us. That's a pleasure.